Today's talk is going to continue uh, my previous teaching on Tonglen. And in my previous teaching, I primarily focused on uh, compassion for ourselves and uh, loving kindness for ourselves. But it, of course, is just the beginning of uh, Tonglen. So what Tonglen is actually about is it's cultivating fearlessness. It is um, opening up that we tend to be in kind of a protective mode, protecting our ego from experiencing harm, kind of in a way, building walls up around ourselves so that uh, we feel more secure. And well, shamatha meditation is very good. We can develop a clinging to the peace that we experience while we're doing shamatha meditation. And uh, that's a problem. We can look sometimes at uh, shamatha as being kind of taking a break or going on vacation from the chaos in my life. Uh, and uh, a way to avoid negative feelings, a way to avoid discouragement, uh, avoid all kinds of different things. So with Tong Len, it is, it counteracts that. With Tong Len, we actually bring it on. We welcome these things that uh, we have tried to protect ourselves from. Um, with shamatha, if done properly, we start seeing things more clearly. But with Tong Len, it's more of a reality check. Uh, you know, this is what's going on in my life. This is what's going on in the world, other people's lives. And uh, we um, dive into it rather than just try to calm it down. And in fact, uh, the reason why shamatha is good to do before and after a Tonglen session is because Tonglen can agitate our mind and it's good to uh, start out with a mind that has a uh, little bit of calming influence from the shamatha and at the end that can help the mind settle down after the Tonglen session. So we begin any uh, session of Tonglen with the uh, aspiration bodhicitta this uh, awakened, courageous heart that, uh, and here in, in Tibetan Buddhism, mind and heart are basically the same thing, that we Westerners think the mind is up here and the Tibetans tend to feel that the uh, mind is in the heart, heart center, not necessarily the beating heart. Uh, so, um, so the, the same thing is uh, uh, present here in this aspiration bodhicitta that we are opening our heart to the practice that um, we're developing a feeling of warmth for ourselves, especially when we start out working with ourselves. Uh, and that uh, while we are looking towards benefiting other beings as well, uh, we benefit from it. So aspiration bodhicitta is wanting to travel the path. It is wanting to do what is necessary to not only travel the path to its fruition, but to help other people travel the path as well. 
So it has an aspiration with two parts, benefiting ourselves and then benefiting others. And there are different types of motivation that are associated with this aspiration bodhicitta. Uh, they are king-like. Second is like a boatman. And the third is a, like a shepherd. And these are how it is described that king-like uh, for a person to become king, they have to gather the resources necessary to be a king. Uh, even if you're a prince, that you have to uh, undergo training, both in uh, uh, education, also, let's say, statesmanship, and perhaps even um, training as a, uh, a warrior. And uh, there are other resources that you need. For instance, you need a good uh, treasury. And uh, so this king-like motivation is that I want to liberate all sentient beings, uh, but I'm going to concentrate on myself developing the resources necessary to do this and then I will be oriented more towards uh, benefiting sentient beings. I'll be in a better place. I'll be able to do more. Uh, the second is uh, like a boatman or a ferryman. And uh, this is uh, referring to uh, in Tibet, that there are many rivers and some of them are quite large. And to get from one side of the river to the other, you need to have a person in a boat who is there to take you from one side to the other. And so here, uh, the motivation is that I will take a few people with me as I travel the path and attain enlightenment because only so many people can fit on one of these boats. And of course, when this uh, analogy was um, developed, these boats were human powered with an oar or oars. So not too many people could go from one side to the other. The third is shepherd-like. And what this refers to is that uh, sheep cannot be led. They have to be, you might say, pushed from behind. And, you know, one will go over that direction and you have to go over there and bring it back to the fold and then this there over that way. And they're going all over the place. It's almost as... Uh, almost like herding cats, not quite so bad, but uh, still uh, you're constantly watching the flock and watching uh, sheep stray and then bringing them back into the flock. And so this type of motivation is that you are committed to leading others before you and more interested in the well-being of others uh, than yourself. And this is considered the best motivation. Any three of these are fine, are acceptable motivation for this aspiration bodhicitta, for our uh, motivation to be practicing and studying and attending programs and so forth. So all three are acceptable. And the shepherd-like, of course, is a very difficult motivation to cultivate. So do what you are capable of. And then, of course, it's good to aspire to have a higher level of motivation. But again, recognize your shortcomings. So the other type of bodhicitta is engagement or activity bodhicitta. This is where we're actually doing things to travel the path. 
Shanti Deva explained it this way that uh, the um, aspiration bodhicitta is like looking at a map, and that activity bodhicitta is like walking on the path. And it's good for us to know, you know, how are we doing? Am I doing more looking at a map or am I actually traveling the path? I wasn't present, but somebody told me that Rinpoche was once asked a question like this, how are your students doing in terms of traveling the path? And his response was that many lay on the path and wiggle. So it's important that we uh, check and see how we are doing honestly, and then uh, try to improve, improve our motivation, improve our practice, improve our outlook and so forth. So in our confusion, we have dislikes uh, and attachment. Uh, we have aversion, pride, jealousy, greed, uh, just all kinds of things. And this is the beauty of Tonglen is that, that we get to work with all of these uh, instead of trying to, you might say, just calm things down uh, we actively uh, work with these. And again, this is where this uh, bravery and courage comes from, that uh, we mentally take on what we don't want and give away what we do want. Uh, we all have Buddha nature. We all have tremendous resources because of our Buddha nature. Uh, our Buddha nature is really the seed of complete Buddhahood. And it's always there, always, you might say, there for us to tap into. Because of it, we can relate to others and their pain. And we can feel our own pain. But when we couple that with uh, egotistic actions, our minds put up walls. They, uh, we try to protect ourselves from pain and we can harden our heart. So this practice opens things up. We open ourselves up to uh, things that we have tried to separate from. Uh, it opens our heart to uh, gentleness, to uh, precision. And again, this is the seed stage that uh, we, you might say, are watering the seeds. And it takes time for it to grow. And with a plant, you have to water it regularly and in an appropriate amount of water and so forth. So this is a good analogy for Honglen practice. We are trying to get this seed to sprout, grow and bloom. There are some examples, classic examples that are given about the Buddha nature. And it is that um, uh, it is like a buried gold statue. And um, what we have to do is uh, dig it up and then clean it up but it has always been there. We don't have to create a gold statue. Uh, the next analogy is that uh, to get butter, we have to churn milk. 
The milk might not uh, give us a clue that there is the potential for butter there, uh, but there is, and it takes work to churn milk so that you get butter. And the third analogy is that it's like uh, uh, sesame oil, that it comes from sesame seeds. And the first thing you have to do is grind up the seeds and then press it, and then the oil comes out. And again here, it might not look like there's oil in whole sesame seeds, but if you work at it and do the proper process, you get sesame oil. So the, the lesson is, or the point is, that it takes time and work to ripen our bodhicitta, that we might not know that it is there, uh, but it is. The Buddha said that it is there, and all of these great teachers that have followed the Buddha's teachings say the same thing. So we need to have courage, we need to have diligence, and we need to trust. We need to trust ourselves and we need to trust what our teachers uh, tell us. In today's world, that there are, there's huge amounts of suffering, people living in fear, that there is fear of COVID, there are wars going on in various parts of the world right now, there is starvation and food insecurity, housing insecurity, uh, climate change. I hear from people more and more that are my age is, I'm concerned about my grandchildren, what world they're going to have. Uh, and of course, if you think about it, that in our next lives, we're going, if we take a human birth or if we take an animal birth, we're going to be born into a world that is very different than the world that we were born into in terms of the environment. And of course, there's always that uh, suffering of old age and looking ahead and realizing that you're going to die. So, the world needs people that are motivated by bodhicitta. The world needs people to help uplift people. And we are in good circumstances relatively that uh, we have fewer problems than most of the people of the world. It doesn't mean that we're free of problems, but uh, we have fewer problems. And uh, if we look at our problems with a calm mind, we realize a lot of them are really not very serious problems. That, uh, for instance, uh, uh, yesterday, I got a delivery through UPS of some uh, supplements in a glass bottle. And uh, the glass bottle was broken. So I have to return it. It's a very easy process. Not a big problem, but if I wanted to, I could make a big deal of it. Especially because two weeks earlier, I ordered another bottle of supplements, a different kind that was in a glass bottle and it arrived broken. And I had to return it and uh, order another bottle that did come whole. But a lot of our problems are really like that, that it's not that hard to, uh, you might say, calm down, take a, a, a closer look, a clearer look 
and realize that compared to what most people are experiencing, this is no big deal. So when we can look at our lives that way, this can help us open up to others, the suffering that other people have. And uh, we start feeling responsible to open up, that it's our responsibility to open up, to ripen our bodhicitta, to put something good in the world. So good feelings are contagious in a good way. And uh, you might say the world needs an epidemic of good feelings spread around and bad feelings are contagious too and so we want to avoid spreading bad feelings so this is why we work on uh, developing courage not giving into our fear our feelings of inadequacy uh, whatever feelings that we have that are negative we can work with them with Tong Lin. And of course, we're benefiting ourselves too by working with others. So shamatha, when done properly, it leads to seeing clearly uh, without judgment. Uh, when judgments arise or other thoughts arise, when we're meditating, we just come drop it and come back to the breath. And Tong Len leads to ripening. So there's a difference between seeing clearly without judgment and actually ripening. And ripening leads to happiness for yourself and for others. And in a way, when you do Tong Len, you are at least mentally giving others a space to connect with their own joy, their own intelligence, their own clarity. That when you go out into the world, you can take this practice with you and any benefits that you've had from doing the practice. But when you're out uh, in a crowd, if you see somebody suffering, you right there on the spot can just mentally do uh, a brief Tong Len exchange with that person. Now, as I started out talking about that last time I uh, gave a teaching on Tong Len, it was working with ourselves. We did a little exercise that I wrote called jailbreak. And uh, here is a quote. Well, actually this isn't the quote of Karmapas. This is a, um, a brief, comes from a brief description of a teaching that Karmapa made on the akagu.org website this trend, uh, uh, you might say summary of the teaching was there. So I'm just going to read from it. The Karmapa then made a surprising statement. Actually, he said, it is more important to generate compassion for oneself than it is to generate it for others. Usually our compassion is turned outward but we should have the courage to turn inward and investigate how we ourselves suffer. The pain we personally experience, he explained, is the basis for developing real compassion, which then extends from ourselves out to others and enables us to truly understand their situation. Quote, they suffer as I do, how great it would be if they were released from it, end quote. So that's a direct quote from the Karmapa. So the person that's making this summary of his teaching says, in sum, just as we have seen our suffering and have compassion for ourselves, so we develop it for others. 
based on our own experience. This way of generating compassion is very important. So this is why last time we did this exercise of uh, putting ourselves in front of us and having this exchange, taking on uh, our suffering from a future self and giving that future self all good things that we feel we can give to that future self. So if you want to do Tonglen for yourself in the beginning of a practice, that's fine. If you need to do Tonglen for yourself to develop more compassion, kindness, acceptance of yourself, that's fine. The important thing is to accept ourselves, be kind with ourselves as we are, and then encourage ourselves to do better rather than looking at ourselves and thinking that there is something wrong with ourselves because we've done all these negative things and on and on and on and on and on. But we're not the sum of the worst things that we've done. We're not the sum of the best things we have done. We're actually trying to go to the point of seeing uh, that we are equal to others, not better than, not worse than. Cut through all of this judgment and see the equality of uh, all beings. And this is equanimity. Uh, sometimes people that are Buddhist uh, develop a lot of compassion for, a, uh, for animals, especially a pet. But uh, usually this kind of compassion is such that you don't really see the cat as your equal. But there's kind of a hierarchy here that you are up here and the cat is down there and you're looking down on the cat. And this can, if you look at it closely, can very easily veer into pity. Or uh, the animal becomes, uh, even though you don't look at it this way, an emotional support animal. So we have to be careful how we relate to uh, other people and uh, animals. And so we have to look and examine ourselves clearly and carefully. So to sum up the practice is that when we breathe in, we're acknowledging the truth of suffering. We're breathing in suffering. And uh, this suffering is not uh, punishment. The reason why this being is suffering, it's not punishment. Uh, and it's not a uh, cosmic mistake. It is the human condition. And uh, we really want to run from suffering. But here we don't run from it, we acknowledge it with the in-breath. And then on the out-breath, we're making a connection with uh, good things and qualities. We're making a connection with joy, well-being, satisfaction and contentment, kind-heartedness, good health, and just plain goodness. And ordinarily we cling to these things. And uh, being open to giving these things away can help us, can help us actually do this in our daily lives in mundane situations. We learn to spread 
these good things around to other people to share it, you might say. So uh, ordinary people want to uh, breathe in the good and breathe out the bad. But this is much more daring and this is courageous. And it is basically being open to anything. And this is why it's so hard to do. So now uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about a specific session and then we're going to do some Tonglen. So ideally uh, meditate have a short session of meditation before. We're not gonna do this today, but if you're doing this at home, it would be good to meditate for five or 10 minutes with the shamatha. Uh, before you do that, generate this uh, motivation of uh, bodhicitta that I'm going to be doing this uh, to uh, benefit myself and all beings. I'm doing this so that I can uh, travel the path and lead others to the completion of the path. When you're finished with the meditation, then just kind of flash on open space. Kind of drop everything and the best that you can just have this flash on uh, open space, openness. Just open up, drop the thoughts and open up. Then we visualize in front of us, facing us, the being that we are concentrating on. And um, to start with, you might be best to uh, do this with yourself. But then this goes in stages. Then you can substitute yourself for a uh, person that you are very close to, that you have a lot of warmth. For some people, it's their mother. For some people, it might be their grandmother because they had a difficult relationship with their mother. But someone that you feel uh, close to that you would like to reduce their suffering. And then this, there's a progression here. And then you put someone that is less uh, closely related, but still a friend, a relative. And then someone that maybe you have neutral feelings to, someone that you know, but it's like, yeah, you neither dislike them but you're not, don't particularly feel close to them either. And you would exchange uh, with them your happiness, giving them and uh, take on their suffering, whatever that may be. And then uh, finally you put in front of you an enemy, someone that you dislike, feel uncomfortable with. And we start with people that uh, bring up rather weak aversion. We don't try to be just fantastic uh, Buddhist Tonglen practitioners and bring it on, whatever. You know, we have to recognize that um, we're not bodhisattvas yet. We're working on it. We're at most baby bodhisattvas. So we start with people that we have an aversion for, but don't have a strong, you might say, <laughs> gut-wrenching aversion for. So uh, when we uh, breathe in, we are taking from that person in front of us, uh, we're taking their suffering and it comes out through their pores and through their mouth, their nose and so forth uh, in the form of black smoke. Uh, kind of like burning tires. It's really kind of revolting and it's hot. And you inhale this. You're, this is a visualization. It goes into your lungs and then it disappears. It doesn't uh, collect in your lungs like a, a vacuum cleaner bag would collect 
dust and stuff off of the floor. Uh, it's a visualization. It has no substance. So it's just gone. And then when you breathe out, your breath takes the form of a white, cool light, and it carries with it what you want to give. And it transfers it to that being in front. It uh, soaks into them, you could say. So uh, when we are breathing in, we're removing suffering from the person in front of us. It takes the form of this hot, thick, black smoke. And then when we breathe out, we're giving them something that is desirable and beneficial and so forth. And we'll replace their suffering with um, perhaps happiness, joy, uh, better health, and so forth. And it's fine to do this with someone that is ill. Perhaps they have cancer. The question comes up, well, can I get sick from doing this? And the way Rinpoche would answer it is that, well, if you were a bodhisattva, you could do that and you would do it willingly. But uh, we're not bodhisattvas, and so you don't have to worry. So, um, in fact, he told this story. And that was, this again happened in Tibet. Don't know how long ago it was, but it was a story of a, a very high lama. And a, um, a Tibetan nomad came to him and told him that his herd of, uh, of yaks and female yaks, the yak is actually a bull. Dri, I believe is a Tibetan name for the females, the one that give milk. But anyway, they had gotten uh, some kind of is, uh, intestinal disorder and were seriously sick. Here where I live, uh, in dairy country, the farmers call it scours. And I think the yaks have a similar digestive tract to the, uh, the cows here. So anyway, what's it called? It doesn't really matter. So the, um, this uh, herder then told his story to this high lama and asked him to come, you know, and do rituals so the herd could get better. So well, the Lama went with the, um, <clears throat> the nomad and they got to his herd of yaks and they built the fire. And the Lama just sat there by the fire and every once in a while I'd throw a stick of wood into the fire. And uh, that's all he did. Okay, that's all the, um, the nomad saw. And then after, I don't know how long, after a length of time, the Lama got up and went home. And the, uh, the nomad was kind of scratching his head, wondering about all of this. And I think he might have followed the Lama back to the monastery and expressed his concern to the attendant of the, uh, the Lama's. So the next morning, the attendant talked to the Lama and explained that the nomad was really kind of concerned. Uh, uh, what did you do? And uh, the Lama said, well, I just did Tong Lan. And you know, when I got up this morning, I had the runs. But of course he got over that. Uh, so, you know, if you're a high Lama, you can do that. But uh, we don't have to worry about that. So um, this out breath, as I said, it's white, it's cool. It carries what we want to hold on to and it transfers to that being in front of us. 
And um, so Rinpoche has, uh, Kempo Karta Rinpoche has explained this practice like this one time. Uh, and that is if you take a piece of paper and you curl it up into a tight cylinder, I mean, a really tight cylinder, and then you want to get it to lay flat, it doesn't lay flat. And uh, the way to get it to lay flat then is to roll it up in the other direction into a tight cylinder. And then it lays flat. But we're kind of looking at ourselves as being wound up in a tight cylinder in the wrong, and we want to be flat. So we kind of go over and overdo it in the other direction for a change. And then we start developing more equanimity and willingness to give. Uh, so on that note, I would like to um, do a little Tonglen practice here. Well, that concludes the Tonglen session. And I would like to open it up to question and answers at this point. The question is, I do the medicine Buddha practice and it would be good to, would it be good to do a Tonglen session after I finish the medicine Buddha practice? And my answer is, well, it sounds like a good fit to me. And if you feel that way, then go ahead and do it.